All right. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, today's topic of conversation, uh, we're going to be looking at HSM, uh, either in Venter or SolidWorks HSM. It's basically the same, same core engine behind it all. Uh, the main focus of the day is high-speed machining and a couple things like adaptive. We're also going to take a look at derived operations, and we're also going to look at operation templates. So a little bit about the agenda. Uh, I'm going to just kind of let everybody on the, on the webcast know who we are and what we're about. Uh, we're going to look at the HSM portfolio. Uh, we're going to discuss integrated CAM versus standalone CAM. Uh, we're going to take a real quick look at the CAM processes. And like I said, our topic that we advertised was adaptive clearing. Uh, derived operations and using operation templates. So that's just a brief outline of what we're going to cover today. And with that all being said, we'll take a quick look at about us. Uh, we are Hagerman and Company. We were founded in 1984. Uh, we're celebrating over 30 years as an Autodesk value-added reseller. Uh, I've actually been with the company close to 20 years. So uh, most of our employees are, are long-term employees and we have a lot of people that can help you out. Uh, we have 21 offices and training centers, uh, mainly focused in the Midwest, but we also cover quite a region to the south and out in California. Uh, we've been an authorized reseller for many, many years in a lot of different disciplines, architectural, manufacturing, civil, plant, government. Uh, we are an authorized training center, so if you guys are looking for a place to get training on any of this software, uh, we are an authorized training center. And we're also a certified AII provider. So that's a little bit about us. Here's a road map as to where we're located. Uh, the stars basically indicate individual offices. Uh, the colored areas are our selling districts. And some outlying areas are more support districts. So today's conversation, Autodesk HSM. Uh, you'll hear this in a lot of different variations. Uh, First of all, if you're an Inventor user, your product would obviously be called Inventor HSM. If you happen to be a SolidWorks user, it's known as HSM Works. Uh, if you're accessing any of this technology via the web, uh, you're looking at CAM 360. Uh, it's basically the same high-speed machining kernel underneath. Obviously, for different products, you have different ribbons and different interfaces. But the core engine is basically Autodesk HSM. It's just available in a lot of different flavors. Uh, speaking of flavors, let's talk about the flavors for just a second. Uh, in your Autodesk CAM solutions, you have on the Inventor side, Inventor HSM Express. Uh, just a quick note here, guys. If you guys are using Inventor and you're looking for a way to experiment in the CAM world, Download the HSM Express today. Uh, it's absolutely free. It, it's not going to cost you anything. It's a professional level, two and a half axis milling and drilling application that runs right inside of Inventor. Uh, now, the caveat to that is the HSM Express is free, but you do need to have Inventor. Uh, now, if you're using SolidWorks, you can do the same thing. Download the HSM Express. Uh, it's a free plug-in for SolidWorks, lets you do the exact same thing. Uh, you can also get on the cloud, if you do a little research on Autodesk Fusion 360, uh, you can access the Express module via the web and try it out there also. Um, that one, I believe, is free for limited use. Uh, if you're needing more than two and a half axis, uh, again, these, these are available. You have an Autodesk Inventor HSM, uh, basically 3D, 3 plus 2 milling applications. Uh, HSM Works is the name for SolidWorks. And again, Fusion 360 gives you access via the cloud. Now, a little note about this. As an inventor, as an Autodesk reseller, if you were to go out and purchase the three-axis module of Inventor HSM, it actually comes with a free package of Inventor. So you can't beat the bargain there. 
Unfortunately, on the SolidWorks side, you do have to own SolidWorks already. Since Autodesk does not sell SolidWorks, they can't really control that aspect of the picture. Now, if your needs are beyond two and a half axis or even beyond three axis, we also have five axis capability. Uh, that's not just necessarily three plus two, as we call it, three axis machining with two axis positioning. It's a full five axis swarf and that type of machining. So those modules are known as Inventor HSM Pro and HSM Works Premium. So it basically comes in your three levels. Uh, you've got your Express, perfectly free, standard, gets into full 3D milling, four axis or three axis plus two, turning modules and even mill turn modules are available in the standard package. You really only need to go to the professional package if you're getting into the full five axis swarf type machining. So that's how it's all laid out, that's how it's packaged. Now quick discussion here as to why you would want to use an integrated CAM package. Uh, it's real simple. I've got a little history, but little history under my belt. Like I said, I've been here for a long time. But just to give everybody a little bit about my background, my first CAM package was actually a product called Tool Chest. Uh, it was developed by Vattel Development Company. I used it for several years actually in production, running up to nine different CNC machines with it. Uh, after I got done with uh, Battelle Development and Tool Chest, I actually went over to SurfCam, spent just a little bit of time in SurfCam because I was getting into a lot of surface machining. And then I started my encounters with Hagerman and Company. When I first started with Hagerman and Company, we were selling a software called SmartCam. That software actually got bought out by a bigger company and dissolved, which put Hagerman and Company in kind of a little dilemma. So we started researching what was out on the market, and we ended up becoming an EdgeCam reseller. Uh, EdgeCam, great product. We ran it for many, many years until recently when Autodesk got involved with integrated CAM. Uh, we decided that integrated CAM is the way to go, and we kind of let edge CAM go to the wayside. Now, why did we go through that decision? Well, I can tell you, I've worked with a lot of different softwares. Almost every one of them follows this procedure. You start with some sort of CAD data, like an inventor file or a SOLIDWORKS file. You export that CAD data into some sort of native format, solids, step, I just once you've exported that data, you're going to import it into your machining package. You know, when I was using SurfCam, we had to build our models, save it, import it into SurfCam. Uh, once you're into the SurfCam machining software, then you define your job setup, define your operations, generate your toolpath, and verify your toolpath and go ahead and post your code. But the key thing to remember here is all these other programs I mentioned, Almost all of them, you have to export your solid, import it into the program. Now, that leads to be a problem when things change. Example, the workflow I just laid out there. Let's say the CAD data needs to update. Somebody added a hole or added a chamfer. Well, now you've got to go back to your CAD program, update the data, re-export it, re-import it into your machining program, of course, when you re-import it, the machining program says, oh, a new file. Well, now you've got to redefine your job setup, redefine all your operations, generate new toolpath, verify it again, and post your code. Now, why integrated CAM? What's nice is having your CAM package built right into your modeling package is you can eliminate all these steps. Basically, you're going to use Inventor slash SolidWorks. You're going to create your CAD data, go right into machining, defining your job setup, defining operations, verifying and posting your code. If something changes, simple. You're already in your modeler, so you just update your CAD data, regenerate your toolpath, verify it, and post code again. You've eliminated almost half of the steps required with the traditional systems. So. Do you want to use standalone CAM or do you want to use something that's integrated? 
Well, this is basically why we decided to stop selling everything else and strictly focus on what comes inside of Inventor or SolidWorks. So integrated CAM is, is not just a lightweight CAM program. It's built in, it's full blown, it's robust, it's ready to go. So example, the way you process a CAM model. Uh, the interface I have up on the screen actually right now looks like Inventor. So you create or open a model. Uh, I'm going to throw a little note here specifically about Inventor. Inventor is obviously a full-blown modeler. You can create anything you want. But it's also fully capable of opening virtually anything out there on the market. If somebody sends you a CATIA file or a Pro Engineer file or just an AutoCAD solid or I can't even name them all, in Unigraphics, if somebody just sends you any kind of file with Inventor, it's file open. Just open it up, it shows up on the screen, you're ready to rock and roll. So whether you create your CAD data or whether you just open it, start with Inventor, open the file, you're ready to rock and roll. You define your job setup. This is a fairly simple process. You're just going to tell the software, my stock is this big, and right here's where I want my zero. Easy enough. You go in to define your operations. Now this is where any CAM software gets a little complex because you've got a lot of choices. You can face, you can rough, you can contour, you can chamfer, you can drill. Uh, the pictures I have on the slide here don't even get into the 3D surface milling. But there's a lot of different routines you can look at. Actually, we're going to spend a little time looking at some of the routines today. But once you define your operations or what exactly it is you're going to machine. You don't have to machine the whole part. You can just machine part of it. Once you define what you're going to, going to machine, then you simulate it. Again, a lot of softwares will dump your file into a third-party simulation software to look at it. With this, you'll notice I'm still looking at the Inventor environment. I can simulate it right on the screen without leaving the CAD package. And of course, once you've simulated it, verified everything's OK, then you come in and you post your code and off to the machine you go. Uh, HSM Works and Inventor HSM both have built-in methods of sending code directly to your software or to your machine. So all that's included. And like it says across the bottom of the screen, in the world of machining, every second counts. So why leave your CAD program? Just run right into it and do it. So our three topics that I promised you guys in our, in our outline. First of all, adaptive clearing versus conventional clearing. This is something unique to HSM, and that's why I decided to do this webinar today on this particular topic. I've worked in a lot of CAM programs. And not too many of them are very efficient with getting material out of the way. Uh, first of all, if you've done legacy type clearing, as I call it, a lot of times your cutter engagement is very uneven. You get a heavy load, a light load, a heavy load, a light load. Sometimes you're cutting air. Sometimes you're taking a full cut. Uh, anytime your tool transitions over, you know a full width cut of the tool. Uh, the thing about adaptive clearing is it's going to regulate the amount of load that's put on that tool at any given time. So what you're going to have is you're never going to see peaks or stress areas on that tool. Now what that means, uh, you basically are going to get consistent cutter engagement throughout the whole clearing operation. That's going to allow you to actually take larger depth cuts with confidence that your cutter is not going to see heavy loads or spikes while it's engaged with material that could or could not normally break cutters. Uh, adaptive clearing strategy results in probably 40% or higher material removal, removal rates. Uh, it's hard to put a number on this, and I'll show you why today. Uh, but from what I've seen, you're going to save at a minimum, a 30% material removal rate compared to your traditional methods. Uh, some of the examples I get into today are going to get up to 40, even 50% faster removal rates. Now, 
One more added bonus to that, uh, your tooling. Tooling's getting pretty expensive lately. Uh, adaptive clearing strategies can increase your tool life by as much as a factor of 10. Of course, that all depends on the material hardness and what kind of shell crust you're cutting. Uh, but just having your tool at the right engagement is what it was designed for is going to increase your tool life by a factor of 10. So with that being said, the first thing we're going to look at today is adapt adaptive clearing versus conventional methods. So let me jump over to the software real quick. And I'm going to open up a part that I've got here. Let everybody take a, a quick look at this part. It's not complicated. It's just got a, a few pockets and a few areas to mill. Uh, it's got some drilling operations in it. It's what I would just say an average part. Uh, everybody's parts are different, so I don't even know what to call average. but this is what we've got on the screen. Just to prove equality, I'm going to go into two different setups here. One is going to be showing adaptive milling. The other is going to be showing a conventional milling. And by the way, they're both available inside this software. I'm just comparing the two. Uh, because to me, you hear the word adaptive out there on the market. What does that tell you? Nobody really knows. Well, after today, you're going to understand what adaptive contouring really is. Uh, now, with that being said, the piece of stock here, setup number one, you can see the piece of stock around my part. Setup number two has the exact same piece of stock. So comparative X versus Y, they're both using the exact same piece of stock. If you take a look at the tool, let me edit this and show you the tool. The tool is running at 1,200 RPM, and it's basically running at 12 inches a minute. Just a standard half-inch end mill. Uh, I can show you the tool, but it's just a half-inch end mill. That's kind of the specs on the tool. Standard four-flute half-inch end mill. Nothing really special about it. But both of my operations, whether I'm doing it as adaptive or conventional, they're using the exact same tool. It's tool number 50. Same feeds and speeds. So I'm not doing anything with the tool that would differentiate one program from the other. Now, what I'm going to show you first is I'm going to come in here. You can look at the top view of this part. You can tell it's a little bit bigger on the left side than it is the right side. So it's got a little taper to it. It is flat walled. OK, what we're going to do look at first is adaptive. Adaptive is up here in your ribbon, 2D adaptive. Basically what it is, it's a roughing format that's designed to eliminate the material. In this case, I'm doing it on the outside of the part. You also have adaptive roughing that can be done on all these pockets. We'll get to that later. Right now I'm just focusing on what, it, what we would have to do to get the material away from the outside of this part. Because obviously we're starting off with a square, square hunk of metal We've got to get it down to the, the core shape. So let's take a quick look at adaptive. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and simulate this. Turn on the stock so you can see the stock. Uh, actually, I'm going to show it a little bit transparent. And I'm going to hit the play button here. And I'm going to let you guys watch this tool. You'll notice the minute it takes off, it is constant tool engagement all the way around the part. And it's going to keep getting closer and closer, and it's going to keep that tool engaged the same amount. Now, you notice you might see there that it took a rapid move. It's going to completely clear off that back corner down to the part. So it focuses on one area, then moves on to the next area. Again, it's following the part. It's going to come down in here, wrap it across, take another cut. Wrap it across, take another cut. I'm going to really slow this down. So I want to show you here. It's doing a rapid, coming back down. It's going to take this cut. Now this time, it's not going to wrap it out. It's going to wrap it while it stays down. When it gets really into tight quarters, it doesn't take the time necessary to zip up to the clearance plane, zip back down. It stays down when it creates its rapid move back. 
I think that might be shown in one more place on the last corner. But you'll notice it rapids across, takes a full cut, rapids across, takes a full cut. There's a little loop there that it stayed down. So it's doing constant engagement to get this material out of the way. You notice 100% of this roughing has been climb cutting. And it's always been the same amount of percentage of that tool. So the tool load is not changing when it's engaged. So that completely roughed off everything around this part. Now, how long did that take in real life? Right at 15 minutes and 16 seconds. I'm going to jot that down on a piece of paper. 15 minutes and 16 seconds. Uh, travel distance of 252 inches, roughly. So let me close this. Now, how did things get roughed out before we had adaptive? I can tell you, tool chest, surf cam, uh, smart cam, they all basically took this approach. You've got your square piece of stock. Let me go ahead and simulate this. And what you did is you basically walked around the part, then you offset it outwards until you got out far enough to catch the corners of the stock. So this is very typical of what most, oper most systems would use for a machining operation. Let me hit play here, and you'll see it nips the corners. Actually, in this front corner, let me pause that for just a second. Did you notice that? It passed through that front corner and took a full width of the cutter. You take a chance of breaking a cutter there. But let me continue on. And you'll notice there's no rapids in this. It's just strictly traveling around the part, taking this material off a little by little as quickly as it can. Same feeds and speeds as the other one. And just to save a little time, let me speed that up a little bit. You'll notice that as it gets closer and closer, it is taking a constant cut every time it's engaged, except the first lap. I could have fixed that by making one more lap. But as we get closer and closer to the part, we'll start slowing this down a little bit. You'll see it starts following the contour of the part as it comes around. You got your little bumps showing up. And eventually, you'll get down to the final lap where you're taking that last bit of material off of there. And you now have the entire part cleaned off. Now, anybody want to take a guess as what kind of time difference that is? It's still removing the exact same amount of material, but let the statistics talk for itself. That particular toolpath you're looking on the screen now took 25 minutes and 36 seconds. So compare 25 minutes versus the 15 minutes that we had earlier. That's a 40% time savings. Uh, and actually, the proof is in the pudding. The last one took 252 inches of machining time. This one actually cut 305 inches worth of travel. So just to give an example, we traveled 305 inches, and we were running at a rate of 12 inches a minute. There's the math, 25 minutes of runtime just to cut that part. So the question I'm going to present to you guys, would you rather just do laps around a part to get the material off? Would you rather use adaptive? and let it take out material with basically a full cut swipe, consistently climb cutting, consistently engaged, except for a few rapids. So right there is where you're actually saving time, is because it is taking the time to get up away from the part, going back for a restroke. Like I said, even that, you'll see it here coming up here in just a few seconds. Right here, after it takes its stroke, it doesn't even come back up. It just comes back for another pass. They do the math to find out whether it's quicker to do a rapid to get to the next position or whether it should stay down and rapid across while it's down. Uh, they have thought of everything that can make this faster and easier on the tool. 
So now you know a little bit about what adaptive clearing is. Uh, I've tried to show a side-by-side -side comparison so you can compare version A versus version B. So that's what adaptive versus conventional cutting is. Uh, HSM has it. I don't know of a whole lot of softwares that have adaptive type clearing, but I can pretty much guarantee you're going to save time using these processes. So let me close that and go back to our PowerPoint. And that's a little bit of discussion about adaptive clearing. Uh, hopefully you guys can understand why it's faster. Again, the example you just saw is hitting right at that 40% faster mark. And hopefully you can understand why it's going to increase your tool life by not having that irregular cut, you know, light cut versus heavy cut. It's always going to have the same load on that tool when it's engaged. So next thing I promised you guys in our outline is derived operations. Uh, derived operations is basically a way for the program to remember what tooling you're using. It's a way to remember what settings you've applied to that tooling and what settings you've applied to your actual profile or pocket mill. Derived operations basically transfer all your tooling and setting information into a completely different type of operation. Not exactly the same as a cut and paste, and I'm going to try to distinguish the difference between the two. If you have a pocket mill and you do a copy paste, you've got another pocket mill. But maybe I want to take a pocket mill, capture the tooling and setup out of it, and then apply it to a contour mill. That's what a derived operation is. Uh, to really distinguish between the two, I, I kind of put together a demo and then I completely redid it. I said, you know what? We're going to do a side-by-side -side comparison because I want you guys to be clear as to what's the difference between having an operation versus just using cut and paste to copy an operation. Uh, a lot of softwares have cut and paste. Not too many of them have derived operations. Uh, I put the little hats there at the bottom of the screen and kind of point out sometimes you want them to be the same, sometimes you don't. A uh, little honor of St. Patrick's Day there. Anyway, the choice is ultimately yours. HSM machining has both. So you get to pick and choose how you want to work. And the little demo I'm going to put together for you here kind of shows both. So I'm going, to, I'm going to do a little bit of both during this, let you guys kind of get an idea. OK. We've looked at adaptive, so we're going to look at derived operations. Open up another part here. Uh, very similar, but different than the other parts. And what I've got in here right now, again, piece of stock, just like before, pretty much. Uh, I've got a 2D pocket already established in here. Now what I'm doing here with this pocket, I did use the conventional method. I like to watch it do the figure eight, but actually adaptive clearing would have been a little bit quicker. But I start with a pocket, and you'll notice I take three passes down to clear out this middle cavity. So I've got the upper lap, the middle lap, and the lower lap. Now, the way I like to do my pockets, again, everybody has their own little personal preferences. But the way I like to do them, I do what I call a three-step process. Uh, I even teach machining using this three-step process. Uh, just because places I've used to work, I used to be a pattern maker, uh, your finish was kind of critical. So a lot of times, you didn't want to rough and finish with the same tool. Sometimes I did a tool change in between. So my three-step process is I usually will come in with an older tool, maybe a regrind. I will rough the cavity out as far down as I can get it roughed out. Right after I rough it out, I usually go straight to the bottom, and I will finish the bottom. That can be part of the same tool path or a separate tool path. In this case, today, I'm going to use a separate tool path because I'm going to put in a tool change because I want to use a nice, fresh new cutter to skim off the bottom. Then once I do the roughing in the bottom skim, 
Then I come back and I clean up the side walls with a nice single lap profile. So obviously I don't have all that machined yet. All I have here is my pocket. So let me right click on this and say edit. I'm going to show you some of the stuff I've got going on in here. First of all, my tool, half inch in mill, it's basically the same tool I had a second ago. Uh, feed and speeds, 1200 RPM, 12 inches a minute, pretty much the same. But what I've got set up in here, let me go to the depth page. And what I want to point out to you, I am doing this in multiple step downs, basically 150 per step down. And I am leaving stock. I'm leaving stock on the side walls of 20 thousandths. I'm leaving stock on the bottom of 20 thousandths, which is going to leave me enough to skim the bottom and, and profile around the side wall to clean it up. Okay. So this toolpath, you can kind of see the settings I've got in it. It's basically done. Now, we're going to talk about derived operations versus cut and paste. Now, I've got a pocket already there. The tool has been defined. The parameters have been defined. And even the selection has been made. This is a case where I may just want to do a copy-paste. Example, I right-click, copy, right-click, paste. And now you'll notice I've got two pocket mills in the browser. They're both identical. One just has a number two behind it. And by the way, you can click here and change anything in here you want to change. So 2D pocket sidewall, or maybe this is 2D pocket. It's not the sidewall. It's actually going to be the bottom. So you can rename anything in there at any time. So to do that pocket bottom, all I need to do is say, let's edit that. I'm going to grab my finishing tool. Then I'm going to go to the depth page. And I'm going to say, you know what? I don't need multiple cuts anymore. And I do not want to leave anything on the bottom. So my axial stock is going to go to zero. I say OK. And you'll see now I've got a nice little skimming cleanup path at the bottom. So now I've got my roughing. And I've got my bottom cleanup path. Now I still need to do the side wall. So question is, should I do the cut and paste again and go in and make changes? Actually, this is a case where I want to use a derived operation. So rather than doing a copy-paste, because I don't want another pocket mill, I actually want to change what I'm doing. So I'm going to right-click on that. And I'm going to say Create der Derived Operation. I'm going to go into 2D milling. And what I want to do is actually a contour cut. I'm not doing a pocket. I just want to do an outer contour of that wall. So I just come in here and say, you know what? I want to convert this into a contour cut. And I'll just say OK, because I don't need to change anything else. And you'll notice it took what I had defined as a pocket mill, and it converted into a single lap contour. Just that simple. I'm going to edit it just to show you one other thing in here. Even on the contour, because I said it was a contour, there is no stock on the side. Now, to show the whole thing, it's probably easier to see it in simulation. I'm just going to go ahead and run this. You'll see it starts roughing out. That was the first operation I had defined, is that initial pocket. I will speed it up just slightly, because I know I'm under a time limit here. So there's lap one. Here's lap two coming in. Actually, let's shut off this toolpath so you can see a little bit cleaner picture as to what it's doing. A lot of settings in here in the simulation to see exactly what you want to see. Okay, so here's our third roughing pass. As soon as I'm done doing this, it's going to switch tools. You won't see it make a tool change, but it's going to switch tools into my finishing cutter. And it's going to come back and skim the bottom. So there's that last 20,000s coming off the bottom. 
You want to leave us a nice clean finish on that bottom cut? And as soon as it's done with that bottom cut, you'll see it retract the clearance plane and come back in for that final cleanup around the outside. So you got a nice clean pocket. That is the way I generally will teach beginning machinists. Uh, that's the way I teach some of the HSM classes. You want to do a three-step process, mainly just get the material out of the way, change cutters, finish the bottom, finish the sidewalls, and get a nice clean pocket. Now, I did that in three steps, the initial pocket. I did a cut and paste to get to this pocket. Then I did what I was meant to showing you is derived operation. Because this is not a pocket, it's actually a profile but I used the exact same settings that I had in my pocket mill. So I saved time just by saying derive that rather than build it from scratch. Hopefully that, hopefully that clarifies the difference. I'm going to take this a little bit further, uh, and this may clarify even more. This pocket mill, I started in that center cavity. Again, just to show the comparison, I'm going to copy that and paste it. I don't need an identical copy inside that there, so I'm going to say edit. What I'm going to do is say, you know what, I'm going to reselect my pockets. Now, here's an example. This thing has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16 pockets around the outside of that. They're going to be machined exactly like the inside pocket is with those three levels, just exactly the same parameters, same tools, same everything. And you'll notice I really didn't have to do a whole lot other than select the geometry. So there's my pocket. Now I did a copy-paste that time. So let's talk about the pocket bottom. I could copy paste the pocket bottom, or actually I think it's going to be easier to copy paste this one. I'll just copy, paste. Now, if you remember the last thing I did on that last one, I'm just going to say edit this. All I did was said I don't need multiple depths, and I took off that axial stock. So just doing those two changes, I'm cutting those same 16 pockets again on the bottom. Give it a second to generate. And you can see I've got that bottom pass. Now, question. How would I get those 15 pockets contoured? Obviously, if I did it from scratch, I would have to select all 16 of those pockets again. I don't want to have to select them all again. I'm going to do the same thing I did a while ago. I'm going to basically take that pocket mill, I'm going to derive it, and make a contour out of it. Just one click, say OK, and voila, there's my contour. It beats the heck. It, it's definitely faster to be able to derive that than it is to reselect it, build a new path, or even the copy-paste where you have to go in and make a bunch of changes. You notice I kept the same settings I had here, but all I did was I changed the type of cut. So with that being said, simulate this, run. I'm going to go really high speed here. And you can see I've got a nice cleanup on the inside of this part. So now you've seen a part like this cleaned on the outside. You've seen a part like this cleaned on the inside. So hopefully I've done enough there to distinguish for you guys what the difference is between copying and pasting a toolpath versus actually deriving settings from one toolpath to create another kind of toolpath. Now the one that you guys probably all came for, the biggest one, of course I always save the best for last. So let's go back out here to our PowerPoint. Let me close this first. And let's take a look at our very last thing here. Operation templates. Uh, the idea behind an operation template, 
most of us have a job. I know when I was a pattern maker, every job that came through the door was different. But at the same time, every job that came through the door had a lot of similarities to the last one. So the question is, is it really different or is it similar? Uh, if you've got jobs coming through the door that are very similar to one another, you definitely want to take a look at using a template. What a template is, the program has factory defaults. Uh, if I just went into the program right now and said, I want to do a pocket mill, uh, you guys may already have the program, maybe you've already done it. You get a helical entry. You get what the factory decided is your preferred default. Well, what this is going to do is give me my own set of preferred defaults. There's a certain way I like to do my pockets. I can get those guaranteed every time. Uh, this can be applied to a single operation, a complete set of operations, which I'm going to show you in a second. And you can recall these preferences anytime you want on any part you want. So it's not exactly like, I'm showing my pictures here, a piece of paper is a template over your part, or maybe a plastic guide. Uh, what it is, is actually stored settings. Now with that being said, let me jump in here and show you a little bit about these stored settings. Uh, this one ought to be fairly easy for you. They're stored as a template. I'm going to edit this with Notepad and show you what the inside of it looks like. So just to scare the daylights out of you guys, what you need to do to create a template is get you a nice editor and start learning HTML and XML code. No, I'm just kidding, guys. You do not have to know any code. I just wanted to show you how it's stored. Uh, what's nice about this is I have done this. Uh, rather than recreating a template, if there's one little tweak I want to make, I can come in here and I can change anything about my spot drill. I can change anything about the drill that's being used, how it's being used. Uh, actually, the one that I opened up here is a three-step drilling process. It starts off with a spot drill. It goes into a drill. And then it's eventually going to come through with a counterbore. So it's a three-step operation that I've got stored in a template. I will actually come back and apply this one in just a minute, but I just wanted to show you what the insides of them look like. So back to Inventor, and let's just go to, um, I can take these at, at random, let's start with this one. Uh, kind of an interesting shape part. I've got a setup in there, basically zeros right in the middle of the part, got a piece of stock. Now what I'm going to do here, guys, and I, I've done a little webinar similar to this where I said high-speed machining is a really high speed. This part has a profile. It's got pockets. It's got drilled holes. It's got chamfers. It's got an odd shape. It's got a lot to it. But what I'm going to do here, I'm looking down at my clock. You guys, uh, I think you can see the clock in the bottom right corner of my screen. It's 1144. Uh, I'm just going to wait until it clicks to 11.45, but if I come in here, create from template. I've got a template out here that's called my part. It's all inclusive. It's got six different operations in it. So I'm going to say create from template my part. Just waiting on my clock to tick to 11.45 before I actually start this. There it is, 11.45. So my part create all templates. What it does is it puts a lot of operations into the browser. So just give an example, face mill. Yes, I'm going to face it. All I have to do is say edit. There's my tool. I say OK, and I've got a face mill. 2D adaptive, edit. That would be the outside profile. Say OK. 2D pocket, edit. In this case, I've got three pockets. So I'm going to pick all three of them and say OK. 2D contour, edit. Yes, I've got contours. I've got a contour there, 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 and there. You can have as many as you want. I'm going to say, OK, do I have to drill something? Yes. I'm going to say, edit. I need to drill that hole right there. OK, that happened to be a spot drill. Then I'm going to do actual drilling of the hole. 
and this, it happens to be tapped. So I'm going to go ahead and tap that same hole. And in basically one minute, I have just completely machined an entire part. Let me go into simulate, hit play. And what I want you to notice, notice the cut step over that this tool is taking. You know, it's almost taking an 80% swath. I've got adaptive clearing going around the outside of this part. You notice that constant cutter engagement. You see a little rapid move, so I can come back and clean that corner off. There's that corner. And then it's going to do the longer piece here in the front. Got that done. Going to come back, clear off this back corner, and clear off this front corner. Okay, it goes immediately from there right into pocketing. I'm going to speed up the pocketing here a little bit. Again, I'm doing that whole three-step process where I'm cutting out the depth first. Then I'm going to do a slight skim across the bottom. And remember my third step of the process, the outside cleanup profile? It just did all three of those. There's your roughing. There's the skim at the bottom. And then I've got the outside profile cleaning up the outside profile. How does it know to do all that? Because that's exactly what I stored in that template. It's stored the way I like to machine those pockets exactly the way it wants to machine them, the way I set up the preferences. So I'm not getting the out-of-the-box stuff. There's the contour. Again, that's that little chamfers around all the tops of these pockets and even around the outside of the parts. And then boom, boom, boom. There's my spot drill, center drill, some people call it. Follow it up with my drilling. And follow it up with the tapping. Again, a complete part machined, simulated, and ready to go out the door in what about a minute. Uh, I could actually do it in less than a minute. just depends on how much I'm trying to talk and demo at the same time. Now, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Let's watch this. I'm going to open up a completely different part. So here's a part, right? Just right click, create from template my part, create everything. Again, same thing, face mill. Yes, I do want to face mill it. 2D adaptive. Yes, I am cutting the outside of it. Pocket, yes, I have some pockets. That one, 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 that one. And even though the inside is a multi-step pocket, perfectly all right. I can choose both of those steps. I say, OK, what else do I have? My contour, you know what? This one doesn't have a chamfer on the top of it. I can just delete that one. I don't care about the chamfer, so I don't need it. Uh, drilling, yes, I've got the same tapped hole. So let me uh, just go to edit and pick the hole. Edit, pick the hole, and tap. Yes, I do need to tap the same hole. And again, less than a minute, I've got an entire part ready to go. Uh, notice I'm getting the same width of cut on this tool. I'm getting the same width of cut on this tool. I'm speeding this up because you've already seen a lot of this on the other part that I did. Again, the pockets are being machined the same way that I prefer the roughing. Then it'll have the little skim at the bottom. Then it's going to clean up the sidewalls. Again, through all the pockets. Even though my middle pocket had multiple depths in it, even that, there's the bottom skim. Then it's going to come back and do that ledge that I had in there. And even it is going to have that bottom skim and the outer cleanup profile. Again, there's all my center drills. There's my drills. 
there's my taps. If you happen to realize you may have forgot something, I did forget the center holes in there. Not a big deal. I can right click from template. I have my 632 counterboard hole saved as a template. So I just take that, create all templates. Uh, the first drill is going to be the spot drill. The second one is going to be drilling of the hole itself. So I need to actually pick the hole. And the third one is going to be my counterbore. Do that. So just that quick, I can add another set of holes to your part. So is the part similar to the one you did before, or is it a brand new part? And by the way, you don't even have to be doing this for machining. I can jump in here, go to simulate, and right there, I've got my full machining runtime. This thing's going to take one hour and 11 minutes to run. I can quote the job in less than a minute. Just throw the part on the screen, put your defaults in it, and you, you can start quoting jobs without actually machining them. Uh, I've got a few minutes left, so what I'm going to do, uh, just to show you, it always applies. I'm going to open up another part. Again, it's different. I put different stuff in here just to prove that we could. Again, create from template, my part, create them all. Face mill, yes, I'm going to do that. 2D adaptive, yes, I am going to machine the outside of the part. Pocket mill, yes, I've got some pockets. I've got one there, one there, one there, one there, and one there. Uh, 2D contours, I don't see any chamfers. Again, just like before, if you don't need it, just take it off the list. Uh, drilling, yes, I want to drill. I'm going to catch that hole. And you notice the software even picks up all the holes that are identical to it. So if you happen to have one hole that was different, it would stand out for you. So drill and tap the holes. Just, again, less than a minute, I've got the entire thing programmed. Click Simulate. I can simulate it. Again, it's got all my preferred settings, width of cuts, depth of cuts, outside profile, pockets. Again, if you watch this pocket, you'll see it does the roughing. You'll see it'll do the little skim at the bottom right now. No, nope, one more. There's, no, nope, one more. There's the little skim at the bottom. Then I've also got a skim going around the outside wall. Again, the way I prefer to cut, and I'm not sitting here telling the software that every time. I'm just saying, here's a pocket, here's a pocket, here's a pocket, go do it. So that is what operations is all about. You can set up your preferences, save it, put it out there, let it do the machining. Even if it's multiple pockets within one zone, that's fine. Again, spot drills, drills, taps finished part in under a minute. Now, how is all that done? Real simple. You can take any, any operation you've created. Just go back in jobs you've machined. Pick out any tool path that you just like, oh, this is the ultimate path. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm falling in love with it. This is the way I want to do everything from now on. All you have to do is right click on it, say, store as template and just call it whatever you want to call it. My, my perfect demo pocket. Save. So now anytime you open up another part, whether it be you know back to this original one or whatever, you want to run that, it's just a matter of right click, create from template, my perfect demo pocket, and you just pick the pocket. Oh, Edit, pick the pocket you want to machine or pockets, say OK, and when it machines it, it's going to be your ultimate beautiful setup. And that kind of wraps things up for me. Again, you can recall it any time on any pocket. Uh, we're going to open up the floor for questions. I don't know if Tad has been answering questions as we've been going, but... Uh, let me bring up my meeting panel here, and I'll try to field some questions if any of them come in. 
Yeah, hi Clayton. I've been answering uh, uh, questions and I don't see any that are unanswered at this time. All right. Do we need to read any of them out loud? And well, we had a, a customer that uh, asked about um, the available machines with the software or post processors. And uh, uh, for those still listening, there's uh, probably more than a couple dozen post processors that are shipped with the software. Um, I'm going to raise that on you. I know there's over at least 75. Yeah. There's also a really okay. nice website, uh, cam.post. Let me see what it's called here. Uh, yeah, cam.autodesk.com slash posts. And you can go to that website and look for uh, your machine slash control. Um, there's also a forum on the Autodesk forum page that's monitored by post-processor gurus. You can upload and download and, and share information there. That's free. Um, so a lot of that stuff's free. Uh, Hagerman and Company is also uh, offers CAM support, and uh, we're more than capable of tweaking post-processors for for our clients and happy to do so. Um, we understand that the G code's the bottom line, so uh, we'll do what's needed to to get your machine making chips. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. We'll wait about another 60 seconds, and then we'll probably close out. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, hopefully you got what we promised you, and hopefully we got uh, some good information out to you. Well, if there are no further questions, um, this will conclude our broadcast. I want to let you know that um, you will receive a recording of this webcast in an email from GoToMeeting um, probably tomorrow. It usually takes a day for it to get to you. Um, if you have additional questions that you think of later, you can simply reply to that reminder email you received from GoToWebinar, and we can get those to Clayton or whoever they need to go to to be answered. Once again, if you could fill out that short survey, we would appreciate it. And otherwise, um, thank you for attending today's webcast. Thank you, Clayton, for the great presentation. And have a great day, everyone.